is at the Rockies now. The strangers come, the black bears crane their necks. The strangers come, the strangers come, the ordeal is almost on. Everything's so tedious and long Until one terrible day The strangers come to Lulu At a glance, Lulu enjoys a spring bloom from a storybook. Soon, her survivors will think back on today and say wistful things. The way we were, before it happened. The convoy crosses its final state line. For now, I strap on my boots and I set out to document likely future victims. High school rowing captain. Duncan Coons. There's this guy in my class, Robbie, and his older brother Sam kept getting in trouble. Like, pretty basic stuff, you know? I heard he stole a car once. But, uh, I mean, they're folks, man. <laughs> Not having it. Their mom gets all pissy at him, you know, she's chewing him out, she's screaming all in his face, and I heard he pushed her. And they just went crazy. The thing is, though, they're respectable people. They got their name on stuff around here. You know, the public pool, they got a they gotta look to keep up. So, you know, what can they really do? Right? So they send them off to like this, um, just this, this place. Basically a prison, but not really a prison. Off, I, I don't know, maybe on an island somewhere. Where the laws are different. Where uh, Sam, Sam had a really bad time. You know, you talk about kids living in a stable and water, you know, bad stuff with water, being hungry. He came back different, right? And his parents go to pick him up at the airport thinking, great, they fixed our kid. He'll be good now. No. He says, I want nothing to do with you people. Stays at his grandma's place. He doesn't finish high school and it's curfews. Who can come around, no bar in the car, no girls in the house, pay him 70 bucks a week to watch his uncle who has, uh, you know, uh, brain problems. And they say, what do you need with money? Y you know, we, we already give you everything. So, uh, Sam's life is a mess. And Robbie, his younger brother, Robbie's captain of the swim team. And Robbie doesn't like swimming. Robbie doesn't like being captain. Robbie is more miserable than his brother. And he looks over at Sam, who he's not even supposed to see. And he thinks, damn, these people will crush me. And I'm not saying my mom's necessarily the crush me type, but I know the expectations. Just 81 more days and I'm gone. It's important not to set up base camp until I know what I need, what questions to ask. Locations of interest, people to stick near or stay far. I've been itinerant, with too much equipment and materials, and it's too early to be exhausted. I'm tired of sleeping in forests and drainage ditches. So I'm putting it out there to the universe. I need a viable base camp. Please, now. So what is the nature of what looms? How does it get you? What is its shape? There are inner aspects. Identity loss, loss of time, a feeling of being occupied, distrust in the senses. There's also a physical and grotesque system of parts. It moves through the hamlet, the wilderness, the metropolis, countries with all kinds of cooking, culture, tradition through crab boils, barn parties, fiestas, the dust of Lee County, Texas, tunnels outside Havana, Lake Tanganyika. I believe for the first time I'm ahead of them. Now in the midst of his own investigation, 
with his writing utensils where they go on his desk in perfect parallel. Deputy Steve Steves IV. I trust the commendation bars give their own testimony. If so, I'd like to enter into more casual discourse to relate to you an amusing anecdote of my officerial life. <clears throat> Arnie Kramer's property borders the station to the west. There are balloons on the mailbox from his daughter's birthday party last weekend. Arnie arranged for a bouncy room and a sheet cake. I stopped by to wish a happy and festive time to the darling little miss and to caution Arnie of the risk of staph infection so rampant in bouncy room culture. Assured a safe time was underway, I returned to my office where I stood, as per the police officer's oath, without favor or affection. I observed through the blinds. To my great concern, I did bear witness to an incident of excess temper and gesticulation involving Mrs. Janet Coons and Mrs. Melba Carnes. Mrs. Carnes, in an uncharacteristic agitation, hastened to go, leaving a deep, muddy gouge in Arnie Kramer's lawn. This flagged my attention, and I feared the worst. 5.02 in progress. Drunk driving. All at once, I found myself in hot pursuit of the mother of four careening down the 97, the precious little ones captive in a four-door death machine. I engaged the lights and sirens of my squad car. I gave chase. Thankfully, she pulled to the shoulder without contest or incident. Upon completion of a field sobriety test to my relative satisfaction, I found her system clear of inebriance or foreign substances. It was only anger, but you can't spell danger without it. The next morning, Sergeant Mary Ann O'Connell took me aside to tell me Melba Carnes had been, quote, scandalized. Standing like a flamingo, saying the alphabet backwards, touching her fingertips to her nose, her children helpless in the back seat. Rubbernecking motorists casting glares and judgments. I had embarrassed her. I had made her sad. I had distressed the sweet, tiny munchkins. I had shocked the community to its very core. But, what if? To this question, I have not been furnished with what I deem an adequate alternative protocol. And to all this, she laughed. Sergeant Mary Ann O'Connell, she smiled, she squeezed my arm up here by my shoulder, and she told me that I was a good cop. She said I did a good job. So I'm writing an apology note to Mrs. Melba Carnes to let her know I care and to let Sergeant Marianne O'Connell know I'm listening and that I care. Without favor or affection, impossible. I'm trying to love Janet Coons, whose rage I need to believe comes from knowledge people can be better. I need to love the man called Brownie, who ruined last year's Independence Day bonfire when he decimated it with a homemade gasoline bomb. A prank, he says. A cry for laughter. I want to love Carl O'Connell, who was touched last night when he found his birthday present, a scuba diving watch, stashed away in the backyard shed. He had already been mourning his marriage. He was sure this was the year the police sergeant would forget him entirely. I need to love in this way because I need to understand what is. Because my memory of love will measure things when they change. I'm trying to love Rick Langerhands, six foot three of mostly legs, with his vague parade of friends he calls the guys. Just whoever saddles up next to him at the saloon. I'm trying to love the 73 crushed Rainier cans in the bed of the Ferry Douglas Field Services truck in Rick Langerhand's driveway, stashed between the push mower, the job box, and the generator. I'm trying to love local contractor, Rick Langerhands. So he has the fieve. 
baby fever. The other day she looks at me dead in the face, flails her arms in the air, straight screams at me, Rick, I have the feet. And like doing it to conceive is so lame. And that's like makes it into work. You know, uh, taking the scenic route. And we're on the calendar about it, you know, just got to work around it, take long lunches, get it in between errands. And uh, she's starting to worry. Mm. Me and Sally got together when we were 15. There's something like uh, 80 of us in our graduating class, so, you know, folks get in a hurry. There's pressure to lock it in. You ever. Yeah, you know, lose it in musical chairs. That's the thinking at the time, so. So, about a year and a half ago, we were at the block party, and Sally got kind of drunk, and was kind of being, I thought, overly friendly with the guy that runs the pharmacy, a dude, Carl. And I was pissed, you know? I'm still pissed. And I could see people noticing them and looking at me like, is he going to do something about this? And, you know, it was embarrassing. I couldn't believe she was doing this to us, you know? So, yeah, I make a scene. And then I get sent away. And uh, a week later, and uh, I still haven't come down. And just like it was the most natural thing in the world to do, I make an appointment. And I get it done. You know, get clipped. <sighs> Down there. Get rid of my swimmers. And uh, just, you know, never came up. And, and now it seems a little late to mention. And now Sally's really ramping it up. Like reading, researching, fertility potions and all that. And... This Thursday, I got a dip from work early. I guess she logged us in for like a consultation at a fertility clinic. And I just hope to God it's not the same doctor.